You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. The fable of Isis and Osiris, as it has descended to us in the account given by Plutarch, has not been greatly amplified by any modern research. The Egyptian fragments, which have been translated in recent years, offer no complete account of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Osiris, nor has any new key been found to unlock this great drama, which may well be termed the Passion Play of Egypt. It is not our intention to perpetuate Plutarch's account merely for its outward appearance, but rather from the same motive that inspired Senecius, Platonic philosopher and Christian bishop, to compile his account of the same fabulous history. Senecius, in his treatise on providence, and you hear that word a lot in the secret societies and especially in Freemasonry, thus introduces the Osirian myth. Quote, This fable is Egyptian. The Egyptians transcend in wisdom. Perhaps, therefore, this also being a fable obscurely signifies something more than a fable, because it is Egyptian. If, however, it is not a fable, but a sacred discourse, it will deserve in a still greater degree to be told and committed to writing." Unquote. In presenting a summary of Plutarch's account, I am omitting nothing which could in any way be regarded as relevant. I am taking the liberty however, of somewhat expanding the fable by incorporating therein some small fragments derived from other Greek writers, and occasionally a few words bearing upon the account from fragments of Egyptian religious literature. The story, then, is in substance as follows. The goddess Nut, whom Plutarch identifies with Rhea, was the daughter of Shu and Tefnut, she is the wife of Seb, also known as Saturn, and the mother of Ra, or Helios, also known as the Sun. Now, if we are to trust uh, Plutarch, she afterwards becomes the wife of Ra, or the Sun. Nut is unfaithful to Ra, who, discovering that she is with child by Seb, pronounces a curse upon her that she should not be delivered of her progeny in any month or year. Thoth, which is Hermes or Mercury, who is also in love with Nut, comes to her assistance with a stratagem. He plays at tables with the moon goddess, Selene, and wins from her the seventieth part of each of her illuminations. And joining these parts together, he forms of them five days, which he adds to the calendar. Previous to that time, the Egyptian year consisted of 360 days, the exact number of degrees in a circle. Now, these five days being not part of any month or year, Ra was outwitted. You see, because upon these days, Nut brought forth her five children at different times in different places. Upon the first of these days, she brought forth Osiris, and the place of his birth, according to to Deodorus was Mount Nisa in Arabia, the happy. Mount Nisa is now Mount Sinai, folks. At the moment of the birth of Osiris, a voice sounded throughout the world saying, quote, The Lord of all the earth is born. Unquote. On the second day, Nut gave birth to Aurorus, the elder Horus. On the third day, Typhon or Set. On the fourth day, Isis and on the fifth and last day, Nephthys. The Egyptians, therefore, regard the five days, which they term the Epact, are superadded, as the birthdays of the gods, especially venerating the fourth of them upon which the benevolent goddess Isis came into being. Plutarch, further on, announces that the five children of Nut were not all of the same father, thus contradicting his earlier statement. For he says that Osiris and the elder Horus were the children of Ra, 
that Isis was the daughter of Thoth, and only Typhon and Nephthys were actually the offspring of Seb. There is another an even more recondite legend regarding the elder Horus, which denies him the fathership of Ra, declaring him to be the offspring of Osiris and Isis, while they were still in the womb of Nut. Now these accounts we shall consider later. Osiris was given to Pamelus to be educated, and having come to the years of majority, became the king of Egypt. In this high capacity, Osiris applied himself to the civilizing of his nation, turning the Egyptians from their previously indigent and barbarous course of life to a happy and community existence. He taught them agriculture, compiled for them a body of laws for the regulation of conduct, instructed them in the reverencing and worship of the gods, thus establishing Egypt in all the essentials of truth, according to the legend. Now, having brought his own nation to prosperity and enlightenment, Osiris traveled over the rest of the world, converting peoples to his disciplines, not by force, but the persuasion of reason. Osiris was accompanied on this journey by a procession of nymphs and other superphysical beings who filled the air with music and song. In the meantime, Typhon, brother or half-brother of Osiris, had ambition to usurp the throne, but the vigilant Isis, sister-wife of Osiris, was too watchful. Typhon, however, having persuaded 72 other persons to join him in his conspiracy with the aid of a certain queen in Ethiopia named Aso, perfected a plot against Osiris. He fashioned a chest exactly to the measurement of the body of Osiris, which chest he caused to be brought into the banquet hall where the princes of Egypt were feasting their king's return. Typhon Simulating jest, promised this elaborately ornamented box to the one whose body, upon trial, most nearly fitted it. Now each of the princes, in turn, lay down in the box, but each was too short or too tall, until last of all Osiris himself lay down in it. Immediately the seventy-two conspirators rushed to the box, clamped the cover upon it, fastened it with nails, and poured melted lead over all the cracks and crevices. After this, they carried the chest to the bank of the Nile and cast it into the river where it joins the sea. Now this evil deed was executed upon the seventeenth day of the Egyptian month of Athir, when the sun was in Scorpio. According to some, it was in the twenty-eighth year of the reign of Osiris and to others in the 28th year of his life. Now try to remember these numbers. If you can't, jot them down. But these numbers will crop up again and again and again. Scorpio crops up. 17 crops up. 28 crops up. And many other numbers. And they all have significance in the mystery religion of Babylon, the secret societies, and to the guardians of the secrets of the ages. As soon as Isis received word of this crime, she cut off one of the locks of her hair and put on the mourning apparel of widowhood, for which reason the spot. Where she did this was afterwards called Koptos. That's Koptos, or the city of mourning. After donning the widow's weeds, Isis set forth in search of her husband's body and wandered about all Europe <laughs> Europe, wondered about all Egypt, asking all with whom she came in contact. You see, I may be back here in the United States, but a lot of my thoughts, folks, are still in Europe. Finally, some children who had been at play told Isis that they had seen the accomplices of Typhon carrying the chest to the Nile. For that reason, Egyptians regard the words of children as oracular and pay great attention to them. 
While Isis was searching for her husband's body, she learned that Nephthys, her sister, had by magic insinuated herself into the presence of Osiris before his death, and in the guise of Isis, had conceived a son from him. Now Isis sought out the child, which Nephthys has deserted for fear of Typhon's anger, and adopting it, attached it to her person as a constant guard and attendant. This was Anubis, the dog-headed god, who appears in the Book of the Dead and in many of the Egyptian hieroglyphics. After some time, Isis learned that the chest had been carried by the sea to the coast of Byblos. Now, Byblos is also the name for book or Bible, where it had lodged in the branches of a bush of tamarisk, which had grown up miraculously about the sacred receptacle and concealed it within its trunk. Now, remember this tamarisk and remember that it is a tree. The king of Byblos, amazed at the miracle, caused the tree to be cut down, and from the trunk containing the box, he made a pillar to support the roof of his palace. Now by magic, Isis discovered this, and traveling immediately to Byblos, attached herself to the suite of the queen as a nurse to her children. At night, when all the palace was asleep, Isis transformed herself into a swallow and fluttered around the column, bemoaning her fate in strange, sad notes. In due time, Isis revealed her divine nature and asked that the pillar be cut down. Taking therefrom the chest, she departed with it into a desert place where she performed certain magical rites by which the body of Osiris was temporarily animated. And by this animation, she received from Osiris a son who is called the younger Horus, the child who was conceived of the dead. Now, there is some confusion in the account at this point. Plutarch says that Isis left the body of Osiris temporarily to visit her son Horus, just mentioned, but the context of the fable would rather call for her departure to a secluded place where the child could be born without the knowledge of Typhon, who certainly would have destroyed him. Isis hid the chest in a remote and unfrequented place, but Typhon, hunting one night by the light of the moon, chanced upon it. Knowing its contents, and realizing Isis to be proficient in magic, he resolved to thwart her purposes, and tearing the body into fourteen parts, he scattered them over Egypt. Now remember, fourteen parts. Folks, don't forget that. From the inscriptions on the Metternich stele, it seems that Set must have imprisoned Isis and her son Horus. The goddess is made to say, quote, I am Isis, and I came forth from the house wherein my brother Set had placed me, unquote. Thoth, the prince of law again came to her assistance and aided Isis to escape from the house. Was it a, really a prison? Or was it really the house of Set? Thoth, also at this time, prophesied that Horus would sit upon the throne of his father and rule the double empire of Egypt. Upon the advice of Thoth, Isis hides the child in a papyrus swamp thus saving him from the wrath of Set. Isis returning, having left her son at Butos, and fashioning a magical boat out of papyrus, traversed the whole of the empire. As she met with the scattered parts of her husband, she buried each one separately. First, however, encasing it in a magical mummy composed of wax, incense, and grain seed. She finally recovered all of the parts of Osiris except the phallus, or the penis, which had been thrown into the river and devoured by three fishes. This organ Isis reproduced in gold. Remember this also. Remember the three fishes, for they represent ignorance, superstition, and fear. They also represent the church, the state, and the mob. And remember that Isis reproduced 
this member, this organ, in gold, and having performed all of the ceremonies necessary to ensure the life of Osiris in the underworld, she returned to her son Horus, and by the theurgic arts, of which she was mistress, saved him from death, from the stings of scorpions. Horus, having grown to man's estate, and having received from his mother the tradition of his father's murder, longed to avenge the evil deed. Osiris appeared to his son in a vision, instructing him in the means by which he could overcome the hosts of Typhon. Now we are led to infer that Horus gathered about him an army which, meeting the hosts of Typhon, battled with them for many days, achieving victory. Typhon, according to the legend, was taken prisoner and turned over to the custody of Isis. Now Isis, being his sister, could not bring herself to put him to death, but set him at liberty, which so incensed Horus that he laid hands upon his mother and removed from her head the insignia of royalty. Thereupon Thoth gave her a new helmet, made in the shape of an ox's head. Typhon next accused Horus of illegitimacy, but Thoth proves his royal descent. Typhon again goes into battle against Horus. In fact, two battles are mentioned, in both of which Typhon is worsted. And Horus regains the kingdom of his father and is regarded to at least a certain degree as the actual reincarnation of Osiris. So here you've had a death and a resurrection. After its resurrection in the underworld, the shade of Osiris visits Isis, and in consequence thereof, she gives birth to another son, as it were, by a holy ghost, for she knew no living man. This child is called Harpocrates, and Plutarch says of him that he, quote, came into the world before his time and lame in his lower limbs, unquote. Harpocrates is usually depicted as a nude figure, his head adorned with a single curling lock of hair on the right side, this being with the Egyptians a symbol of youth or adolescence. He is sometimes depicted with an elaborate plumed headdress or wearing the double crown of the northern and southern empires. His finger is placed to his lips, which Plutarch interprets as a gesture symbolic of his childish and helpless state. The Greeks and Romans, however, considered this gesture to be a symbol for silence or secrecy, and from this has arisen the custom of placing the finger to the lips as a motion for quietness and secrecy, and we do it today. Statues of the god Harpocrates were placed at the entrances to temples and sacred retreats where the dramas of the mysteries were performed as a sign that silence and secrecy should be observed in the holy places and that all initiates were bound by vows of discretion. Harpocrates is also sometimes shown standing and at other times he is depicted seated on the blossom of a lotus <laughs> just like Buddha. Although he is usually figured with childish immaturity of body, the imperfection of his lower limbs, as described by Plutarch, is not apparent in any of the Egyptian drawings. It therefore seems that the statements concerning this deformity should be more carefully examined. Samuel Squire, whose translation of Plutarch's Isis and Osiris, made in 1744, is still the most often quoted by Egyptologists. Well, he states definitely, quote, lame in his lower limbs. G.R.S. Mead translated the same essay much later and gives a slightly different rendering of Plutarch's words. Mr. Mead says, quote, weak in his limbs from below upwards, unquote. This difference in wording, though slight, may have an unexpected significance. You see, there is some general information contained in Senecius's Treaty on Providence that should be included in this 
Osirian epic. Senecius is of the opinion that Osiris should be regarded as an historical king whose father, transcending in wisdom, instructed his benevolent son in all the secrets of the divine science of government. Senecius is moved to this conclusion by a desire to keep all speculation within the sphere of the reasonable. The Platonist bishop seems to have derived much of his account from origins foreign to Plutarch's treatise, or possibly he interpreted differently the restrictions imposed by his vows. Senecius, a prudent and conscientious author, wary of myths and fables, and exhibiting a truly platonic conservativeness in his handling of subject matter, yet Senecius was beyond question a deeply religious philosopher and an initiate of pagan mysteries prior to his conversion to the Christian faith, and therefore may have hidden the true meaning of the fable. Thomas Taylor is of the mind that the treatise on Providence was written while Senecius was still a votary of pagan mysteries. Now, if so, the writing is unbiased and trustworthy and presents a fair picture of the mystery, mystical uh, traditions of the Egyptians interpreted in terms of platonic metaphysics, but only the exoteric would be allowed to be seen by the profane. Senecius inserts into his narrative a considerable description of the various character of Osiris, which he sharply contrasts with the vice-ridden nature of Typhon. He also explains, in detail, the process of election by which Osiris came to the throne of Egypt. The electional ceremony, as described by Senecius, is evidently itself a fragment from some secret ritual relating to the installation of a hierophant of the mysteries. Next, Osiris receives from his father an elaborate dissertation in the platonic temper concerning the relative power of good and evil, in which he is fully warned against the machinations of Typhon. Possibly the most important sentence in Senecius' treatise occurs during this dissertation. The father of Osiris is made to say to his son, quote, you also have been initiated in those mysteries in which there are two pair of eyes, and it is requisite that the pair which are beneath should be closed, when the pair that are above them perceive, and when the pair above are closed, those which are beneath should be opened." Unquote. Now these words unquestionably have an arcane meaning and are incorporated into the narrative that the true significance of the whole Osirian cycle might not be entirely obscured. And I can tell you that the meaning, folks, is that the eyes above are the exoteric meant for the outer world, for the profane, and the eyes below are the esoteric meant for the initiate, the adept, the priest of the mystery schools only. Senecius does not describe the death of Osiris, but merely reports his vanishment and final restoration to the throne. In the latter part of the story, there was also introduced a certain philosopher who was a stranger in Egypt. This philosopher predicts the fall of Typhon and is an eyewitness to the recrowning of Osiris. Senecius says of this philosopher, quote, he likewise then learned some particulars about Osiris which would shortly happen and others which would take place at some greater distance of time. vis a -vis when the boy Horus would choose as his associate in battle a wolf instead of a lion. But who the wolf is, is a sacred narration, which it is not holy to divulge even in the form of a fable." Unquote. Well, the lion, we know, has always been of the tribe of Judah. Such is the amazing tradition of the good king Osiris, the first victim, the first mummy, and the first resurrection. He dies and is born again in three forms. First, as God of the underworld, where he rules the justified dead. Second, as the younger Horus in whose form he battles for his own honor. 
and third as Harpocrates, the silent child. The latter two forms are regarded as incarnations or embodiments of his very self. Yet he exists independent of them as the judge of shades and the lord of the resurrection. Now we know that Osiris was also known as the sun, and Horus was known as the child or the young Osiris, the young Horus, the baby Horus. So after the sun set in the west, when it rose the next morning, it rose as the young Horus, and as it went across the sky, it became Osiris and then the elder. But in the legends, it's differently at different times, Osiris or Horus. Horus the younger, Horus at his peak strength at noon, and Horus the elder. It is also Osiris. So you see that these figures intermingle in the legend, but it all has meaning, and it will all be clear to you at a later time. Now, just because you don't understand some of this, and you may be a little lost, don't worry, it will come together. Don't, don't miss one single word of this series of episodes of The Hour of the Time. If you do, I can guarantee you will regret it for the rest of your life. We're going to stop right now, folks. We have to take a break. I will be back right after this very short pause. Nearly all writers attempting an interpretation of the Osirian cycle have recourse to Plutarch. It has seemingly never occurred to Egyptologists that this eminent priest of Delphi might have purposely confused or distorted the fable, or, if not that, might certainly have misdirected the attention of the reader from relevant to irrelevant explanations. Two factors must certainly be taken into consideration when reading Plutarch. First, he was an initiated priest of the mysteries. Of this there can be no doubt. For he himself says, quote, For the mystic symbols are well known to us who belong to the brotherhood, unquote. And in those days it was known as the Brotherhood of the Snake, and those who possessed the knowledge of the secrets of the ages wore the symbol of the snake on their headdress. And in the Egyptian hieroglyphics, you can see the members of the mystery religion of Babylon in the hieroglyphics as they wore the snake on the front of their forehead. It should be evident to everybody that as an initiate Plutarch would not have unveiled the secret meaning of the Osirian myth and I found that to be absolutely true no man of his priestly station or philosophic mind who so greatly venerated the gods as to attach himself to their service would have been guilty of the impiety of profaning their mysteries and he would not have violated his oath of secrecy. Furthermore, had his treatise actually exposed any of the secrets of the rites, he would most probably have perished miserably, or at least been publicly disgraced. These evils not descending upon him, we must suppose that his book was regarded as harmless and for our purpose, therefore, at least not directly informative. The second factor which gravitates against the likelihood of Plutarch's interpretations being correct is the condition of Egyptian metaphysics in the first century after Christ. If, as Budge maintains, the Egyptians themselves were unaware of the meaning of the word Osiris long prior to the Christian era, into what decay had the old rites fallen even prior to the Ptolemaic period? Now, if Pluto based his accounts upon popular traditions, they were most certainly inaccurate, and it is not impossible that even the priests themselves were for the most part ignorant of the origins of their doctrine. It should not be inferred, folks, from the general literature available concerning this Osirian cycle, and the mysteries, 
that all of the priests were themselves initiates of a high order. Only a small part of them ever actually received the greater secrets of their order. For the rest, rite and ritual suffered. And it's the same today. Democritus spent a great part of his life in Egypt, and from the priests of that nation, he secured the foundation for his celebrated doctrine of atoms. That's right, folks, atoms, A-T-O-M-S. A doctrine which has survived as a scientific fact to this day. From all these different philosophers who visited Egypt, we shall secure a better estimation of the profundity of Egyptian learning than from even the Egyptian writings themselves. Plato went to Egypt and was initiated into the mysteries in the Great Pyramid, where he lay for three days and three nights in the sarcophagus, during which he was imparted knowledge which he was to guard, protect. He describes his initiation in his writings. I suggest that you read it. If we can assume the pragmatic viewpoint that the substance of matter is to be determined from its consequences, then we must indeed highly reverence the wisdom of the Egyptians. For it seems that first among the consequences of that wisdom is civilization itself, that cannot be doubted. Civilization is no fable, nor is it a progeny of myths, but that which is real and substantial. And it bears witness to a profound and superior wisdom, which must have existed over a great period of time, and have been communicated to at least a privileged few since the very beginning of man's cultural impulse. Now we can also take the example of Pythagoras, the great philosopher while a youth, if we may credit Iamblichus, associated himself with Thales of Miletus, from whom he gained a considerable knowledge of the mysteries. Thales, being at that time of great age and infirm body, apologized for his incomplete understanding of the sacred doctrines and urged Pythagoras to visit Egypt, the motherland of wisdom, as it was called in those days. Iamblichus wrote that Thales confessed that his own reputation for wisdom was derived from the instruction of these priests, but that he was neither naturally nor by exercise endued with those excellent prerogatives which were so visibly displayed in the person of Pythagoras. Thales therefore gladly announced to Pythagoras from all these circumstances that he would become the wisest and most divine of all men if he associated with these Egyptian priests. Iamblichus then describes the journey which Pythagoras made to Egypt, how en route he was initiated into the mysteries of several nations, and at last, arriving at his destination, was received by the Egyptian priests with respect and affection. He associated with the Egyptian philosophers for some time, and after demonstrating by his sincerity and consecration that he was worthy to associate with the initiated, he was at last admitted into the secrets of their orders. Quote, he spent, therefore, observes Iamblichus, two and twenty years in Egypt, in the Adyita of temples, astronomizing and geometrizing, and was initiated, not in a superficial or casual manner, in all the mysteries of the gods. Pythagoras must be acknowledged among the first of those divine men to whom the race is indebted for the principles of science, art, and philosophy. And are we to presume that so noble an intellect could have spent 22 years pursuing fabulous shadows in Egyptian crypts? If, as some have asserted, Osiris signified merely the Nile, and Isis, the black earth, rendered fertile by its inundation? Could such a fable have so greatly stimulated the admiration of Pythagoras that he would have spent a score of years in the assimilation of the idea? I don't think so. 
Or again, would he have spent this great length of time, the very best years of his life, in memorizing the myth-encrusted history of an ancient king who at some remote period had reigned in Egypt and whose memory seemed sufficient to inspire a vast civilization for some 6,000 years? And by the way, that's the exact number of years in the calendar of the mystery school and of the Freemasons? Or would he approach the matter from another of these explanations? Would Pythagoras have pounded himself for a score of years against the walls of Memphis and find himself fully rewarded by being informed with bated breath by some archai magus that Isis is the dog star? I think not. It's not impossible that in the course of its long and illustrious history, folks, Egypt devised many opinions relative to her sacred myths, but no such explanation has involved Egypt alone. Her histories, her heroes, or her agricultural problems could have caused illustrious men from all parts of the world to have visited her in quest of essential wisdom the central core of which is the myth of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, known as the Osirian cycle. The Nile meant nothing to the Greeks, who cared little whether it rose or fell. And the sneezing you hear in the background is my dog, Sugar Bear, who always accompanies me into the studio to do these programs. Not Egypt. But the Umbos of Delphi was the center of their universe in Greece, and local fables derived from Egypt's 42 gnomes could never have won for the double empire its illustrious reputation as patron of all learning, human and divine. So we must look deeper. And look deeper we did, folks, and what we found is amazing. For we found that Osiris and Isis and Horus were not ever have meant to be, nor were they ever real people or real gods or spacemen who came from some other world. Not at all. As we have found in our research, and as I have found in my over 20-some-odd years of research into the mystery schools, they are like all the other symbols of the mystery religion. For the public for the profane they are the exoteric and you may make of them what you wish the adepts the initiates the priests they don't care what interpretation you give the exoteric meaning and the esoteric is so entirely different from what you may suspect that the answer will surprise you you see we cannot be deceived by the obvious and you can never be deceived by the obvious or even consider the obvious when looking at any of the mystery religions or the secret doctrine. And we cannot allow ourselves to be misdirected by the evident subterfuges, the deceptions of these ancient priests who so carefully concealed their arcana from the uninitiated world that we at this late time may even doubt its existence. Yet now, today, it is thriving to the point that it controls all levels of our society, military, and government. The ignorant, the sheeple, even among the Egyptians, might derive their inspiration from the processionals and rituals of the state religion, but that's just for the sheeple. For those great philosophers who came from afar were in search of the highest form of human knowledge, the ancient arts, the secrets of the ages, and could not be satisfied by such outer show. Had these fables been but hollow and unsubstantial forms, Egypt would have been the ridicule of the wise who would speedily have exposed her sham and reduced her vain pretense to a humble state. But this did not occur. You see, the initiates of her mysteries returning to their own countries not only felt themselves more than repaid for their hazardous journeys and long vigils, but furthermore, 
They became founders of distinguished systems of thinking, disseminators of useful knowledge, and in all cases bore witness to a broad and deep learning, and they always took with them a plan, a plan for the unfoldment of a world utopian government which plan still exists today and is still being carried out in secret as the completion of the great work. Diodorus describes two famous columns erected near Nysa in Arabia, one to Isis and the other to Osiris. Now remember, Osiris and Isis never lived, they were not re real people, and they were never gods. They are symbols for something much deeper. So when you listen to the interpretation of the inscriptions on the columns, remember that. The column to Isis bears this inscription, quote, I am Isis, queen of this country. I was instructed by Mercury. No one can destroy the laws which I have established. I am the eldest daughter of Saturn, the most ancient of gods. I am the wife and sister of Osiris the king. I first made known to mortals the use of wheat. I am the mother of Horus the king. In my honor was the city of Bubastus built. Rejoice, O Egypt, rejoice land that gave me birth." Unquote. The column to Osiris bore these words, quote, I am Osiris the king who led my armies into all parts of the world to the most thickly inhabited countries of India, the north, the Danube, and the ocean. I am the eldest son of Saturn. I was born of a brilliant and magnificent egg, and my substance is of the same nature as that which composes light. There is no place in the universe where I have not appeared to bestow my benefits and make known my discoveries." Unquote. And the rest of the inscription, of course, was destroyed. Now, while the inscription on the pillar or the obelisk in honor of Isis may be veiled, the inscription on the obelisk dedicated to Osiris is certainly not. He was born of a brilliant and man magnificent egg, and his substance is of the same nature of that which composes light. There is no place in the universe where I have not appeared. Osiris, of course, was the sun. In examining Plutarch's treatise, the introductory remarks appear of special significance. Yet, folks, these remarks are wholly ignored by Egyptologists who are content to confine themselves entirely to the fable which constitutes the larger part of the writing. If Plutarch, by any word or symbol, reveals even a small part of the sacred mystery, it is to be found in the following words, quote, For Isis, according to the Greek interpretation of the word, signifies knowledge as does the name of her professed adversary, Typhon, signify insolence and pride. A name, therefore, extremely well adapted to one who, full of ignorance and error, tears in pieces and conceals that holy doctrine which the goddess collects, compiles, and delivers to those who aspire after the most perfect participation of the divine nature. Now, if you have a keen intellect, you can all decipher everything else that I'm going to tell you on this program and probably the next one in that short paragraph. And I'll let you ponder that as I continue. Osiris, the black god of the Nile, must be regarded as the personification of an order of learning. For Plutarch identifies him beyond question with the holy doctrine or the mystery tradition. Now remember I told you Osiris is the symbol of the sun, but the sun was the symbol of the power of the all-encompassing God of the universe, and later you're going to learn that the light or the sun represents something even deeper. It represents, dear listeners, primordial knowing, 
the gift of intellect. And where people can read these myths and think that these people really worship the sun or some god somewhere, they are mistaken. For the true object of their worship is the intellect. And through the use of that intellect, they believe that man will become God. As Thoth personifies the whole sphere of knowledge, and it was through his assistance that Osiris came into being, so Osiris embodies the secret and sacred wisdom reserved for those who were proficients in the ancient rites. Unquestionably, Osiris was later confused with other members of that vast pantheon of divinities which developed in the decadent period of Egyptian religious culture, but to the elect, the initiate, the adept, the priest, he represented to the end primordial knowing, that utter realization of truth undefiled by intellection, unlimited by any mortal procedure, uncircumscribed by the limitation of thinking. You see, he signified not only that divine at one with the absolute, which is the end of all illumination, but by his life, death, and resurrection revealed the means by which mortal consciousness could achieve that end. Now remember, at one Thus Osiris becomes a dual symbol, being in the first place the esoteric wisdom. Esoteric, folks, means hidden. So he represented in the first place the esoteric wisdom itself, and in the second place the composite order of initiates through whom that tradition was perpetuated. And now we begin to strip the veil from the mysteries. The personality of Osiris thus typifies the institution erected by the ancients to perpetuate the deathless truths of the soul. The living head was crowned with the plumes of wisdom and power. The hands bore the scepters of the three worlds, but the body was bound with the mummy wrappings of the dead. Here we find spirit, the living head, bound incongruously to matter, the mummified body. The soul was imprisoned in the narrow bonds of flesh. And one thing through my research is certain. Osiris represented the secret doctrine prior to that time when the omnific word or the lost word of Freemasonry was lost. Osiris is the first of the five children of Nut. And here you begin to part some more veils behind which the mystery resides. He therefore corresponds with the first of the five divine kings of China and the five exoterically known Diana Buddhas of Lamaism. The five children of Nut are the five continents which have appeared upon the earth and the five races which have populated these continents. Osiris is the primitive revelation of the first race. But as Isis was born upon the fourth day, we find this tradition coming into Egypt through the Atlantean mystery school of which Isis is the symbol. And you will find at the base of all of these things Atlantis. In this country, the Freemasons established the city of Atlanta as the new Atlantis. And all of this will come together for you. It took me many, many, many years of study deep into the night and trying to discuss this with other people who had no idea what I was talking about. So most of it was put together in loneliness late at night and then when I established my organization known as the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, many others begin to help and furnish, 
furnish bits and pieces of information. And we have succeeded, folks, in infiltrating the Lodge. We have members in the Lodge who feed us information constantly. Members whom we taught how to take an oath so that the oath of Freemasonry would not be binding upon them. You have to play sometimes by the rules of the enemy in order to beat the enemy. And we are beating the enemy now. From the reign of Osiris we glean the following philosophical history. They believed that there was a time, the golden age, when truth and wisdom ruled the earth and this aristocracy of wisdom was a benevolent despotism and that's what they want to reestablish. Benevolent to who? <laughs> that's the question. In which men were led to a nobler state of being by the firm, kindly hand of the enlightened sage. This was the divine dynasty of the mythological priest kings who were qualified to govern humanity by virtue, not only temporal, but by divine attributes. Through his priests, Osiris, representative of the hidden tradition, ruled the entire world by virtue of the perfection resident in that tradition. Don't miss tomorrow night, folks. You have not even begun your journey. Good night. And God bless each and every one of you. Welcome once again, folks, to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper, and tonight we continue on our series of the origins, the history, the dogma, and the identity of Mystery Babylon, the secret organization that has infiltrated every level of our society, military, and government, and are bringing about a totalitarian world socialist government that they call the New World Order. Tonight, Part 4. The Hour of the Time, ladies and gentlemen, is brought to you tonight by the Pilot Connection. That's the Pilot Connection. How would you feel if I were to tell you that income tax is voluntary? And if you know how to untax yourself, you would never have to file another income tax return, pay income tax, or keep the records associated with those who are termed taxpayers. Now, if you're like me, you'd be very curious. And like me, you would want to look into that, as I did, and I became a member of the Pilot Connection. And I no longer have to do those things, folks, and I can tell you that it works. I completely inspected all of their records I talked to their people and I can tell you unequivocally that there is no law that specifically and unequivocally requires anyone to pay taxes and if you do it right you will never have to pay them again now if you would like to find out how you can be one of us who are designated legally as non taxpayers Write to the Pilot Connection. That's the Pilot Connection. 6333 Pacific Avenue, Suite 334, Stockton, California, 95207. That's 6333 Pacific Avenue, Suite 334, Stockton, California, 95207. Or you can call them at area code 209-957-5493. That's 209-957-5493. Tell them William Cooper sent you. Well, folks, we left off with a great revelation for those of you who were listening last night. For those of you who weren't, you need to order the tapes beginning with the tape of February the 11th, Thursday night, February the 11th, which was the name of that tape is The Dawn of Man. And this series actually starts on Friday night, February the 12th, but you need the tape, The Dawn of Man. Order all the tapes in this series because if you really want to know what's going on, how it has been kept alive for thousands of years and what the ultimate goal is 
their origins, their history, their dogma, and their absolute identity, then you need this whole series. Now, to get this series, you can call Stan at 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. If you're a CAGI member, just send in $7.50 per tape. Tell them which tapes you want, and you'll get them. If you're not a CAGI member, they're going to cost you $17.50 per tape. No buts, no exceptions, no deals. Want a deal? Join CAGI, folks. That's how we support ourselves, and that's how we um, get people involved. Well, let me continue. And I think tonight is really going to open your eyes. And remember, we're nowhere near even begun. we got a lot of shows to do on this, folks. And it's going to blow your mind if it hasn't already. I think some of you out there already know that. Now, if we concede that Osiris is the positive pole of the universal life agent, as the mystery school does, then Isis becomes the receptive pole of that activity. He is the doctrine, she is the church. As in Christianity, it is customary to refer to the church as the bride of Christ. So in Egypt, the institution of the mysteries was the great mother, the consort of heaven herself. From this interpretation, we gain a deeper insight into the symbolism of the whole Osirian cycle. Isis, you see, becomes the temporal order of the priesthood, the accumulative body of initiates. She is personified as the temple. She is the mother of all good, the protectress of all right, and the patron of all improvement. Now remember, this is the belief of the mystery schools. I'm not telling you what I believe. What you're learning on this program is what the mystery religion really is its origin, its history, its dogma, and its identity. So don't get confused here. Don't get confused. According to the mystery schools, she ensures nobility, inspires virtue, and awakens the nobler passions of the soul. As Diana of Ephesus, she is the multimamia who feeds all creatures from herself. And many of you may have seen uh, illustrations in books or little statues or portraits or pictures on somebody's wall of Isis in the role of the Maltamamia, where she has many breasts all over her torso and on her legs and arms, all over her body. Well, that's what this represents. As Diana of Ephesus, she is the Maltamamia who feeds all creatures from herself. Like the moon, she shines only with the light of her sovereign sun, spelled S-U-N, even as the temple can only be illumined by its indwelling truth. So Isis is the moon, Osiris is the sun. And remember, remember what this means, folks. He is the doctrine, she is the church. You see, the Osirian legend, the Osirian cycle, was never about real people. It was never about gods or goddesses. But it is the method by which the real object of worship and the real mystery of the mystery religion of Babylon has been concealed. And it is only one of the ways, as you will see. Typhon according to the mystery schools, is the embodiment of every perversity. He is the negative creation, the airman of Zoroasterism. And remember, we talked last Thursday about the movie 2001, and in the beginning of the movie, the musical score that you hear, the name of it is also Sprach Zarathustra, which is a tribute to Zoroaster, which is the androgynous god. The combination in one of the positive, the negative, good, evil, male, female, 
etc., etc., etc. It is the concept that Christ is also Lucifer, or that they are twins, and that's what they teach in the Mormon Church. Typhon, according to the mystery schools, is black magic and sorcery, the Black Brotherhood, also known as the Jesuit Order. Nephthys, his wife, is the institution through which he manifests. He is neither a single evil nor even a sequence of ills, but an infinite diversity of them, indescribably insidious, empowered to infect the fabric of church and state. The enemy of the mystery schools are three, the church, the state, and the mob. And, of course, the mob is us. Typhon lured Osiris into the Ark of Destruction at the time when the sun enters the house of the scorpion. Hence we know him to be the eternal betrayer, our Judas, that ageless Judas who undoes all good things and inevitably presages ruin. He is the power of the physical universe which is constantly seeking to destroy the spiritual values locked within its substances. You will see that they have a talent for turning things around. He strikes in the eighth month and now it is supposed that a child delivered in the eighth month of the prenatal epoch cannot live because of the curse of Typhon. Osiris was born in the seventh month, and thereafter it may be said of him that he was delivered prior to the rule of Typhon. And that's why our forefathers, all Freemasons, established this country by the signing of the Declaration of Independence in the month of July. And this will all become clearer to you as we go along. Of all good things... Typhon is the opposer, according to the mystery schools, occupying the position of the eternal negative. This evil monster may well be generalized under the appellation of the adversary. In the initiation rites, he is also the tester or the trier. Quote, the Lord who is against us, unquote. According to the mystery religion, he is the personification of ambition, and ambition is the patron of ruin. It was ambition that set Typhon plotting for the throne of Egypt, designing how he should destroy the power of his brother. A learned Jesuit father sees in Typhon Cain and in his brother Osiris Abel. If such a parallel actually exists, then the biblical allegory is susceptible of the same interpretation. But you see, they have twisted everything around. Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati, was a Jesuit priest and a professor at Ingolstadt University, which is a Jesuit university. The Jesuit order was founded by Ignatius Loyola. He was the head of the Ilumbrados in Spain which is the order of Illuminati long before Adam Weishaupt even came along. He was arrested by the Dominican monks under the Inquisition and used his power of association of those who had influence and power to beg an audience with the Pope. Now, nobody knows what occurred during this audience, but he emerged as the head of a new order called the Jesuits. Now, the Jesuits was just another name for the Ilumbrado, for he took his organization that he already controlled and made it into the brotherhood of the Jesuits. The Jesuits went on to foment rebellion everywhere that they went and the Pope gave them incredible power and made Ignatius Loyola immune to any prosecution from any source. And it was they who trained Adam Weishaupt, and it was Adam Weishaupt who formed the branch of what we all know as the Illumined Ones, known as the Illuminati in Bavaria, where he sent out agents to infiltrate the lodges of the secret societies throughout Europe. 
Now you'll begin to understand this even more, folks, as we go along. Right now I understand how shocking some of this may be to some of you out there. But just hang on, continue to listen, because we have many, many more hours of this to go before it will all come together for you. <clears throat> but I would suggest that you begin study on your own. It doesn't matter if you get ahead of us, because you will always need some of the information that I'm putting out here, no matter how ahead you may get or what you already may know, simply because... I've done well over 23 years of research into this, and I must know something that you don't know. <coughs> and if you know something that I don't, please send it to me immediately. And if we can substantiate it, we will incorporate it into this series. Now, let me continue. Typhus lured Osiris into the Ark of Destruction at the time when the sun enters the house of the scorpion. Hence we know him to be the eternal betrayer, that ageless Judas, who undoes all good things and inevitably presages ruin. Now this may sound to you that we're talking about Satan or the devil. But you see, in the mystery schools, they consider their god, Lucifer, to be the true good god, and they consider the God of Christianity to be the evil God. Now, if you listened on the night of the 10th, you, or excuse me, the 11th of February, Thursday, you already understand this concept. Because the mystery religion of Babylon believes that man was held prison in the bonds of ignorance in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God. Lucifer, through his agent Satan, and many believe them to be the same entity, and that's okay. Lucifer, through his agent Satan, released man from the bonds of ignorance with the gift of intellect. And through the use of that intellect, man himself will become God. And that's the heart and soul of the dogma of the mystery religion of Babylon. Now, since I am taking the content of all of these episodes directly from their own teachings and their own writings so that you'll know that this is exactly what they believe sometimes it may sound to you like these are the good guys but remember they are the ultimate perfection of deception and they have intentionally made it this way so that they can get people to join them and stay with them until they're so deeply involved and committed that it's too late. And that is why the degrees of initiation. So stick it out and you'll find out that these guys are the greatest liars, deceivers, manipulators, and scum that exist upon the face of the earth. Typhon in their teachings is the desire of the few pitted against the good of the many. Now, if you understand what I just said, you understand that these are communists, socialists. They believe Typhon is the spirit of dissension and discord that breaks up unity of purpose by setting factions against each other so that great issues lose the name of action. The desire for riches, pomp, power, and, listen to this, folks, sovereignty, by which this evil genius was obsessed, reveals the temptation by which humanity is deflected from its ultimate goal and led into the byways of sorrow and despair. Typhon, the queen of Ethiopia, and the 72 conspirators represent the three destructive powers preserved to modern Freemasonry as the murderers of the master builder Hiram Abiff. You will see that Hiram Abiff was never murdered. In fact, in the Bible you will see that when the Temple of Solomon was completed, he went back home to Tyre. But in the Freemason legend, Hiram Abiff, the master builder, was killed and the temple was never completed. So everybody is blaming all of this upon the Jews. It is not the Jews, folks because all of this is a front 
its symbology for what they really, really mean. Hiram Abiff was really, folks, Jacques de Molay of the Knights Templar. And all of this will make much more sense to you several shows down the road because we have lots and lots of information to go through before you put it all together. Now, these three destructive powers preserved to the modern mystery school known as Freemasonry as the murders of the master builder Hiram Abiff, who was really Jacques de Molay, are ignorance, superstition, and fear, what they call the destroyers of all good things. When you get even deeper into their teachings, you find out that ignorance, superstition, and fear stand for the state, the church, and the mob. And those are the things that they have sworn to destroy and substitute themselves as the ruler of the world in a benevolent despotism, a totalitarian socialist state. Because from the very beginning, these people have been pure, true communist socialists. They are the heart and soul and core of international socialism. They believe the advent of greed and perversion marked the end of the Golden Age, the Osirian Age, which the Osirian cycle is just a symbology of this. And the Golden Age, of course, Golden Oro, always has stood for the sun. Osiris is representative of the sun. And outwardly, these people worship the sun. But the sun is just another symbol for their god, Lucifer, the light, the intellect. And with the good prince Osiris, the deeper truth, returned to his own land, he became the victim of a hideous plot. So what is this mysterious chest, so beautiful in its outer appearance, but so fatal in its application? Well, folks, Plato who was wise in the wisdom of the Egyptians and who was an initiate of the mystery school, would have answered that it was the body that lures the soul into the sorrows of generation. Now, if this interpretation is projected into the social sphere, the chest becomes symbolic of material organization. Witness the application of this thought to Christianity, where the pomp and glory of the outer show of a vast ecclesiastical mechanism has all but destroyed the simplicity and dignity of the primitive revelation of the mysteries. That is their exact words. See, I didn't make that up. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of the mystery school. And it is an indication, if you didn't think so yet, that Christianity is their enemy. They intend to destroy Christianity and all Christians. The blood will flow when the new world order takes power in the world. And if you sit back and say, well, I'm not worried because I'm going to be raptured, I feel sorry for you because you are going to suffer tremendously. Because in my research, I have found that most of the theologians in the Protestant religion of all denominations who are responsible for this doctrine of the rapture are Freemasons. And they are in control of the World Council of Churches. They are responsible for the bringing together of the different religions in the World Council of Churches to attempt to merge them all into one and then change the doctrine to the New World Religion. And if you don't believe that, you get off your little butts and go out there and start looking instead of just listening and accepting. For it is true. And their doctrine, folks, is Zionism. I can tell you right now, Jerry Falwell has admitted publicly that he is a Zionist, and we know that he is also a member of the Mystery Schools, and many others that you follow blindly instead of reading the words of Jesus Christ 
You're all split up. Do you know the original teachings of Christ have been so perverted that there are thousands of different sects of the Protestant religion? And the Vatican is the original perversion of the mysteries established by a pagan Roman emperor, a worshiper of the sun. I hope you're all beginning to open your mind. And I know I'm going to get a lot of letters from a lot of fanatics who don't believe this. <clears throat> and those are the people who will be hurt the most when they find out that it is all true. When they find out that it is all true. Back to their doctrine. The murderers rush from the palace with the lead-sealed casket and cast it with its kingly contents into the dark waters of the Nile. Thus are the ideals which lead men into the paths of truth and righteousness obscured, and with truth no longer evident, according to them, error, which is the Christian church, can rule supreme. Typhon, by now you should know, that Typhon is their designation for Christianity. Typhon ascended the throne as regent of the world, swinishly gloating over a dejected humanity he had led in the dark and devious byways. By the Nile may we not understand the river of generation, in the current of which souls imprisoned in mortal nature move helplessly upon the never-ceasing current. Now they believe that truth is dead. And according to their belief, with truth dead, or at least exiled to the invisible world, material facts were superseded by opinions. Opinions bred hatreds, and men finally fought and died over notions both senseless and soulless. And that is another deception and another lie. For in my research, I have found that in every instance of the most terrible things and wars that have ever happened on the face of the earth, these men are the ones who have brought it about <coughs> have brought it about greed became the dominating impulse they say gain the all absorbing end and ruthlessness the all sufficient means in the dark ages of uncertainty when reality hid its face and no man dared to know, the leering Typhon ruled his ill-gotten world, binding men to himself by breeding a thousand uncertainties to sap courage and weaken conviction. Men ask, why seek to know? Knowledge does not exist. Life is a cruel jest, purposeless and of short duration. Because the human mind demanded intellectual expression, Typhon sowed the seeds of intellectual confusion so that numerous orders of learning appeared which were convincingly plausible but untrue. These various orders of thought survived by catering to the weaknesses and limitations of the flesh. Today, our great industrial civilization is feeling the heavy hand of an outraged destiny. The evil genius of our ambitions has again undone us and our follies crumble about us. Typhon rules the world, for the earth today is the arena of the ambitious. Remember? Typhon is their symbol for Christianity. Don't go away, folks. I've got to take a short break. I'll be right back after this short pause. I want you to have a pencil and paper with you. I'm going to give you some information. I shall return. Well, that didn't take long, did it? Tonight's show, folks, is brought to you by the Pilot Connection. The Pilot Connection. Write down this address. 6333 Pacific Avenue, Suite 334, Stockton, California, 95207. That's 6333 Pacific Avenue, Suite 334, Stockton, California, 95. Two zero seven, or you can call them at area code two zero nine nine five seven five four nine three. That's two zero nine nine five seven five four nine three. Who is the pilot connection, and what do they do? 
Well, the Pilot Connection is an organization, a First Amendment educational society that specializes in teaching people the true law about income tax. Did you know that income tax is voluntary? Well, it is, folks. But you just can't go and stop paying income tax and say, I volunteer not to pay because you've entered into certain adhesion contracts which make you liable for income tax. But the pilot connection can tell you how to untax yourself legally and lawfully so that you never have to file another return, pay another nickel of income tax, or maintain the records that those designated as taxpayers, because of their adhesion contracts, have to do. No, if you go through the pilot connection, you will become legally designated a non-taxpayer. I am a member. I have done this, so have tens of thousands of other people. And I can tell you that it is true that it works and that you will have no problem with the IRS unless, of course, Congress changes the laws down the road and then we will have to see what those changes are if they do that. And if they change the law and then it becomes binding that we have to do it again, then we will have to do it. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you would like information on how to join the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, which is our private intelligence organization, the largest and the most successful in the world, and if you've been listening to this program, you know that that is true. Now, if you'd just like to join, send us $45. Just send $45, tell us you want to become a CAGI member, and we'll put you on the rolls and send you all your information, your press credentials, and everything else that you get along with your membership. And believe me, it's well worth your while. Your money comes back to you a thousandfold, uh, as our members, our current members, will be happy to tell you. That is, if you use the benefits. Or if you would like a packet of information, or if you'd like to purchase my book, Behold a Pale Horse, which is 500 pages of the most suppressed information ever published in the history of the world. Call Stan. Talk to him. He's my right-hand man. His number is 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Or just write to Stan and ask him for a packet of information. Write to Stan, S-T-A-N, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Post Office Box 889, Camp, spelled C-A-M-P, Verde, which is Spanish for green, spelled V as in Victor, E-R-D-E, -E, Arizona, 86322. Well, let's get back to where we left off, folks. What then of Isis, the mother of the mysteries? She who was so defiled and desecrated by the profane that her sages and prophets were forced to flee into the wilderness to escape the machinations of the evil one. Is she not the woman clothed with the son of Revelation who flees with her man-child into the wilderness to escape the evil purposes of the great dragon? Well, folks, that's what the mystery school believes, but I can tell you that's not true. You see, the Mystery School was the original college run by Nimrod in the city of Babylon. And the college was a college of priests who practiced the religion of the sun. The college, the adepts, the initiates, the priests were scattered all over the world when Seth, the son of Noah, came with an army and defeated Nimrod. And this is where the legend really comes from, because Seth chopped Nimrod up into little pieces and scattered him all over the land. In the legend of the Osirian cycle, Cyrus was chopped into 14 pieces. Isis came to put him back together again and bring him to life. She could find all the pieces save one, the phallus, or the generative force. It is now known as the lost word of Freemasonry. And the phallus is represented by the obelisk, the monolith. 
It is the penis of Osiris, the generative force. It represents the lost word of Freemasonry. It represents the Luciferian philosophy. It represents the light, the sun, Lucifer, the intellect. In Dealey Plaza, you will find an obelisk. In Washington, D.C., you will find an obelisk known as the Washington Monument. In the courtyard of the Vatican, you will find an obelisk. Should I continue? The family in England whose estates are called Scion House has an obelisk on their lawns. Should I go on? I will. I will go on and on and on and on until you either wake up or I am dead one or the other. And if you don't wake up, I would rather be dead than live in slavery in the New World Order with our Constitution destroyed, the family broken, the children taken from the homes to be raised by the state, Christians and patriots locked in prison camps, labor camps until they are no longer useful and then they will be executed. And the blood will run in the New World Order. If you don't believe me, look back at every single nation where international socialism has triumphed over Christianity and you will see that tens of millions perished were destroyed. Socialism, folks, sucks. And I will not live under such a system. And I hope you agree with me. If you don't like my language, that's tough. I'm fighting a battle against people with no morals, no decency, no heart, no soul, no soul. They do not even believe in God. They do not even believe in God. The glory of Egypt, according to these people, ceased with the death of Osiris. The mighty temples still stood, but the God who illuminated them had gone. The priests bowed helplessly before the dead embers of their altars. And one by one the sanctuaries crumbled into ruin, and the custodians of these ancient truths hid themselves in obscure corners of the earth, lest they be hunted down and slain for the sin of dreaming and hoping for a better day. Isis then, as the scattered but still consecrated body of initiates, began the great search for the secret that was lost. And this is all in reference to Seth's army scattering the college of priests in the ancient city of Babylon. And later it refers to the Knights Templar, who brought the mysteries from the Middle East to Europe. In the beginning, folks, they were never a part of the Catholic Church, as you will learn, and they still exist today, regardless of what you've ever been taught. For they are the mystery school today. In all parts of the world, according to their teachings, the virtuous raised their hands to the heavens, pleading for the restoration of the reign of truth. This congregation of those who prayed, who labored, and who waited, the great congregation of a world in anguish. This is Isis in sackcloth and ashes, searching for the body of her Lord. Searching in all parts of the earth and throughout innumerable ages, inspired men and women, the congregation of the just, at last rediscovered the lost arcana and brought it back with rejoicing to the world over which it once ruled. Isis by magic. For the initiated priests were all magicians, and they are magicians today, resurrected the dead God, and through union with him brought forth an order of priests under the collective title of Horus the Hawk, the all-seeing bird, whose eye is on the reverse of the great seal of the United States of America. 
These were the herds Shesta, or the companions of Horus, and the chief of these, called by Louis Spence, the chief of the mysteries par excellence, appears to have worn the dog-headed mask of Anubis. Anubis was the son of Osiris by Nephthys, the material world, therefore represents the divine man or the mortal being who rose to enlightenment. And those who rose to enlightenment were considered illumined. Collectively, they are known as the Illuminati. And all of you who have fallen for the scam that the Illuminati does not exist, they do. For the term Illuminati merely refers to the collective body of those who are illumined are enlightened, and they are the Illuminati. Ambition, however personified by Typhon, knowing that temporal power must die if divine power in the form of truth be reestablished, put forth all its power again to scatter the doctrine, this time so thoroughly that it should never be rediscovered. If Typhon, as Plutarch has suggested in one of his manifestations, represents the sea, then it appears that this second destruction of Osiris may refer to the Atlantean deluge. There is Atlanta again. Atlantis. Atlanta. The same. Go to Atlanta, Georgia, folks. Drive around in that city. You will see pyramids everywhere. You will see 666 everywhere. You will see the symbols, the all-seeing eye. Osiris may refer to the Atlantean deluge by which the doctrine was swallowed up or lost and its fragments scattered among all of the existing civilizations of that time. And the story continues. The body of Osiris, the secret doctrine, is divided into 14 parts. Remember, Osiris was chopped into 14 parts. They found all save one, the phallus or the penis of Osiris, well, the body of Osiris represents the secret doctrine. It's divided into 14 parts and divided among the parts of the world. And the lost word of Freemasonry is the generative force, the lost part of Osiris, the lost part, the secret of the secret doctrine. So we must therefore understand that it was scattered through the seven divine and seven infernal spheres the locusts and tales of India are by different symbolism through the seven worlds which are without and the seven worlds which are within the Kabbalah of the Jews Bacchus was torn into seven pieces by the Titans and Osiris into fourteen pieces to use the words of Faber quote both these stories are in substance the same for the second number is merely the reduplicate of the first by a variation of much the same nature the ancient mythologist added seven Titanides and seven Kabiri to the seven Titans. Unquote. The parts of Osiris were now scattered so hopelessly that ambitious Typhon or the Titans felt his authority to be secure at last. But wisdom is not thus easily to be cheated. Listen to this carefully, folks. This is their own words. In the dark retreats of Islam, the Sufi explored the depths of nature. Among the Jews, the learned rabbins unraveled the intricate skine of Kabbalism. Among the Greeks, initiates rose to life through the nocturnal rituals, rituals of Eleusis. In India, neophytes were brought to the contemplation of the triple-headed Brahma at Elephanta and Ellora. Through the Middle Ages, the alchemists in their retreats explored the infinite chemistry of existence. The Illuminati sought the pearl of great price, and Rosicrucian adepts sought to recast the molten sea. All these together were but Isis, still searching for the members of her lord. At last, according to the tradition, all these parts were restored again but one. But this one could not be returned. Now you understand why I tell you it's not the Jews, folks. If you're persecuting the Jews, you're making a big mistake. It is some of the Jews. It is some of the Catholics. It is some of the atheists. It is some of all of the people of all of the nations and races and religions of the world. 
and outwardly if they attend a church in your neighborhood and profess to believe in that religion it is a lie it is how they gain influence and power in that community for they worship one God and one God only in the temple without windows the headquarters of which in this country is exactly 13 blocks from the White House the Egyptian allegory tells us that the phallus of Osiris was swallowed by a fish now folks this is most significant and we may even infer that mankind itself is the fish but it even goes any further for this age has been known as the age of Pisces the fish the significant force and the power in the age of Pisces was Christianity and the fish actually refers to Christianity the phallus being the symbol of the vital power of the mystery school and so used in Egyptian hieroglyphics the phallus then is the lost word which is not discovered but for which a golden replica is substituted in the Egyptian hieroglyphics the physical body after the death of the soul or its departure therefrom is called the cot or k-h-a-t and the hieroglyphic for this is a fish thus the physical body of man is definitely tied up in symbolism with the creature which conceived son Horus a term concealing the collective body of the perfected adepts who were born again out of the womb swallowed the triple phallus of Osiris the threefold generative power this golden phallus is the three-letter word of Freemasonry concealed under the letters a U M and all of those of you in the in the New Age movement or all of those of you who fell for all these gurus who came over here and taught you to sit and meditate and while you were meditating hum this Aum A U M <laughs> the golden phallus is the three-lettered word of Freemasonry concealed under the letters A U M how do you feel sheeple and why do you do these things because somebody tells you to Isis by thus modeling and reproducing the missing member of Osiris gives the body of the God the appearance of completeness but the life power folks is not there Isis the priesthood with their initiatory process had accomplished all that could be accomplished by natural philosophy therefore recourse is again had to magic the golden phallus is rendered alive by the secret processes rescued from the lost book of thought thus the divine power of Osiris is restored through the regeneration of man himself and the processes of initiation in the Greek system man was rendered divine because his composition contained the blood of Bacchus they believe and in Egypt because it contained the seminal power of Osiris the institutions raised in the world to perpetuate the deeper truths of life according to them labored on through the centuries seeking for the lost key the living crux and sata which if rediscovered would enliven and impregnate the whole world and restore the good king Osiris to the throne left empty by his cruel death the purpose of the Asaic rite is therefore revealed as twofold the first motive was the almost hopeless effort made by the bereaved Isis to restore her husband to life she hovers above his corpse in the form of a bird trying to restore his breath by the fluttering of her own wings this ceremony is concealed in the book of the respirations the causing of Osiris to breathe again is the great abstract ideal the second and more imminent motive which actuated Isis was to avenge herself upon Typhon Christianity and to destroy his power over the world this she determined to accomplish through her immaculately conceived son Horus which is a term concealing the collective body of the perfected adepts who were born again out of the womb of the mother Isis the mystery school 
Now we can apply this analogy to a great modern system of initiation called Freemasonry, which has certainly perpetuated at least the outer form of the ancient rites to the profane or to the members on the lower rung of the initiatory ladder. To the adepts of the priesthood, the higher initiates, then it is clear. You see, for Freemasonry as an institution is Isis, the mother of mysteries, from whose dark womb the initiates are born in the mystery of the second or philosophic birth. Thus all adepts, by virtue of their participation in the rites, are figuratively at least the sons of Isis. As Isis is the widow, seeking to restore her lord and to avenge his cruel murder, it follows that all master masons or master builders are widow's sons. They are the offspring of the institution, widowed by the loss of the living word, and theirs is the eternal quest they discover by becoming. In the Egyptian rites, Horus is the savior avenger, son of Isis, conceived by magic or the ritual, after the brutal murder of Osiris. Hence, he is the posthumous redeemer. Freemasons are Hori. They are the eye of Osiris, whose body, therefore, is made up of eyes. Each initiate is a Horus. Each is a hawk of the sun, spelled S-U-N, and for one reason is each raised, and that is that he may join the army, which is to avenge the destruction of wisdom and restore the reign of the all-seeing Lord, Lucifer. Each one is dedicated to the overthrowing of the reign of Christianity. The great battle in which the sons of the hawk rout the hosts of darkness is the mysterious Armageddon of Revelation. You see, they believe Lucifer is the god of light, and Jehovah, or Yahweh, is the god of darkness. They believe that the Armageddon of Revelation is the Kurukshetra, of the Mahabharata and the Ragnarok of the Eddas. In this battle the hosts of the adversary shall be routed forever. The great purposes of the Osirian Rite are thus revealed in an unsuspected clarity. The Hershesti are philosophically opposed to the reign of ambition. It is their duty to reestablish that golden age when wisdom personified as Osiris and not selfishness personified by Typhon shall dictate the whole course of human procedure. The day must ultimately come when the Horai, by virtue of their royal purpose, <laughs> accomplish the consummation of the great work. The great work, folks, is the elevation of man to the illumined man, or 666, and the establishment of a one-world totalitarian socialist utopia on earth. The missing word will be found, and the golden substitute will be replaced as promised in the ancient rite. Osiris will rise in splendor from the dead and rule the world through those sages and philosophers in whom wisdom has, been, has become incarnate. It should be particularly noted that the Egyptians do not regard Osiris as wholly dead, but view him as continuing to live in the underworld where he superintends the ceremony of the psychostasia. The underworld is not the sphere of the dead alone. It is the world of the mysteries. Lucifer is therefore God of the hidden fane, the temple which is beneath the earth, the house of the low ceiling, the crypts into which the initiates go in search of truth. He is the dweller who abides in the darkness of the innermost. His throne is not in the objective world, but in that subjective sphere which is the inner life of man. They believe that thus is it arcanely intimated that while truth may perish from society, it cannot die from the heart which preserves the sacred tradition through that natural inspiration by which all men are gradually moved to truth. In the meantime, the widow Isis, the mystery school, continues to produce out of herself the host of potential redeemers. Spiritual education continues from age to age in secret, and though temporarily obscured in this generation or in that, its onward process, they believe, is inevitable. Out of the hidden house, guarded by the silent God, must someday issue the glorious and illumined Horus, 
666 is the number of that man. The very incarnation of his own father, Osiris, or Lucifer, the personification of the Lord of Abydos, the avenger of all, and the just God in whom there is no death. 